let's talk about innovation. And as I thought about it, I thought there's probably nobody that's applied this principle with greater success than Walt Disney himself. People around the world travel to Central Florida simply to experience his dream. I, I want to begin by just reading some of his quotes. Walt said Epcot will take its cue from the new or you could say innovative. If you're watching online, there's an outline. If you're here, it's on the app if you want to download it. He says, take its cue from new ideas and new technologies. This is what? It's innovation. It's taking what's here and broadening it to the next level. He says, that are now emerging from the creative centers of American industry. It'll be a community of tomorrow that will never be completed, but will always be introducing and testing and demonstrating new materials and new systems. And Epcot will always be a showcase to the world of the ingenuity and imagination of the American free enterprise. And so it was his dream that Epcot would be a place where innovation would happen that inspired the world. He goes on to say, all of our dreams can come true if we have the courage to pursue them. It's kind of fun to do the impossible. He says, you know, the way to get started is just to shut up and start doing it. Now he said it nicer. He said, quit talking and begin doing. So that's a real trouble, and it is often, isn't it? We do a lot of talking. Politicians do a lot of talking. Churches do a lot of talking. Christians do a lot of talking. But we don't do a lot of doing. He says, I dream. I test my dreams against my values or my beliefs. And then I take risk. And then I do what? I execute my vision. I do. And it's the fact that I'm willing to take the risk to do something that makes dreams come true. You know, I shared with you a little earlier, one of the things that we're dreaming about as we go into the future is our digital community, our digital ministry. I don't know how much time you spend online, but uh, social media, can uh, just the whole internet can be an incredibly negative environment. It loves, for the sake of clicks, to judge people and criticize people. It can become a place of incredible negativity. Everything is bad, chaos reigns. People can't be trusted. Everybody's coming against you. But what if we could create a community that instead of one filled with negativity was one that was filled with forgiveness and grace and hope? You know, it's the reason that I wrote the book that we talk about is because I want people to realize that they do have an opportunity to pursue their potential or their greatness, to experience the destiny for which God created them. That is our dream. That's what we're risking to pursue, believing that a supernatural God can do supernatural things. Well, King David, who you probably heard of, whether you spent much time in church or not, had a dream, especially after he was on the throne. And if you know his story, that wasn't after Goliath. There was a lot of stuff that happened. But eventually he gets on the throne. And in 2 Samuel, we see the beginning of his dream. Look at what it says. It says, before long, the king made himself at home. And God gave him peace from all of his enemies. And then one day, David said to the preacher, Nathan's the prophet, he's the preacher. The preacher's over at the house. And you can see King David as he kind of looks out the window and he says, you know what? Here I am. I'm comfortable in this house of cedar. I mean, in other words, I'm not at war right now. I've got this beautiful home in which I live in. But the Ark of the Covenant, the chest of God, is still in the tabernacle, which is hundreds of years old. So you can imagine, it was made out of cloth. It must have started to look pretty ratty. It wasn't very impressive. And so he's feeling some guilt about this. And so he's like, I'm going to do something about it. Right? I'm going to build the Ark of the Covenant, which represents God's present. I'm going to build it a temple. We're done traveling you might say. And of course, the preacher has got a wealthy dude who wants to do something for the church, and he's like, go do it, brother. Right? He's like every other preacher who's ever lived. He says, whatever in your heart, go and do it. I'm sure God wants you to do it. And then he leaves, the Bible tells us, and he goes home, and he starts talking to God about it. And you can imagine what Nathan was saying to God. He's saying, God, wow, did I have a visit today. David, you know, he's the king. He's got all this gold and silver. I mean, he's the wealthiest man in this part of the world. And guess what, God? He's going to do something for you. He's tired of that 
raggedy old tabernacle being the place in which your presence is represented, he's going to build you God a temple. Isn't that awesome? And God's like, no, no, that's the wrong dream. That, that, that's not what I want, Nathan. And if you read all of chapter 7, he tells Nathan to go back to King David and tell him, that's not the dream. And same thing is true in our lives. There are times when we get something within our heart and with our mind that makes sense to us. And yet it's not really what God wants to do through our life. It's not really the dream that God wants to put inside of our heart. I put it like this in your outline. You have to dream bigger than yourself. See, David's dream was what he could do for God. I, who am now the king, who is wealthy, who can say and it will be done, I'm going to do this for you, God. And God comes, and if you read the chapter, God simply says, you know what? You're dreaming of a house. I'm dreaming of a kingdom. Your dream is too small. Your dream is just about you. And God dreams much larger than that. And there are probably some of us here today that have a dream that makes sense to us, but in reality, it's just too small because it's just about us. And God says, I didn't create you just for yourself. I created you to do something much, much larger. Walt Disney said, laughter is timeless. Imagination has no age. And he said, dreams, I would say big dreams are forever. God says through the prophet, or the preacher Nathan, he says, when your days are finished and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendants after you. Okay, David, I've got a bigger dream, he says, who will come from you and I will establish what? My house? No, not just my house, a kingdom. He says, David, you're dreaming too big, too small. You're dreaming about what you can do. I want you to pursue what I can do. And just in case you don't know it, I can do all things. I am the king of kings. I am all powerful. I own everything. And so David, I'm not impressed. If you read the chapter, here's what God says to David. He says, David, come on now. He says, my presence has been in that tabernacle. And I went with you guys wherever from Egypt all the way here to the promised land. And he says, David, did you one time hear me ask anybody to build me a temple? I didn't. Because the temple can't hold me, David. You're, you're thinking too small. And I can't help but wonder, are some of us thinking too small? See, after this, David and his son Solomon, who's going to build the temple... Start to get it. Look at what David says in 1 Chronicles. Because you have kings and chronicles that tell much of the same story from different perspectives. And in Chronicles, he says, It was my desire, David talking, to build a temple where the ark of the Lord's covenant, not God's house, but God's footstool. In other words, David comes to realize that his dream was just too small. That God's much bigger than that. And Solomon, when he dedicates the temple, look at what he says. He says, but will God really live on earth? Well, the highest heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple that I have built? In other words, God goes to David and he says, I'm going to build a kingdom. And he says, your son Solomon's going to build a temple. But eventually through you, Jesus himself, who will be the savior of the world, is going to be born. God says, that's my dream. I'm going to save the world. You just want to build a house. Now notice that I put this in your outline. Kings, David's dream was well intended, but it was wrong. It was too small. And I wonder how many times you and I have well intended dreams, but they're just wrong. How are we going to respond to that? Chronicles again tells us. Solomon is referring back to his dad, and look at what he says. He says, now it was in the heart of David, my father, to build a house for the name of the Lord. But the Lord said to David, my father, whereas it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. You were well intended, David. I, I know you didn't mean anything by it. And I know from your perspective, building a, a temple seemed to be the right thing to do. 
nevertheless, it is not you who will build the house, but it will be your son. We can be well-intended and still be wrong. I I've jotted this down in my notes. When you realize you're going in the wrong direction, how do you respond? What, what, what do you do? When you realize you've put the ladder up against the wrong wall, do you continue to try to climb, hoping that you'll eventually get there? Do you try to knock down another door or crawl through a window? What do you do when you realize that what you've been dreaming is well intended? It's just that God has something different or that God has something bigger. When God says no, it's time to stop. I put it like this in your outline. You have to surrender your dream to God's will. In other words, you have to hold your dream lightly. You have to realize at the end of the day, it's not your dream. It's God's dream for you. It's why he created you. Years ago when God put in our heart to, to leave Arkansas, to, 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 I, I wanted to go to Southern California because I love the weather there. It's just dry. Now, I think it makes you old, right? People from California. I'm sorry if you're from California, you have a cracked face. But, you know, here in South Florida, we just sweat, okay? But I wanted to go to Southern California. I could wear a sweatshirt every night. I just, I just, I just oh, I just wanted to. And so Steph and I flew out there. And we visited with different uh, churches. We visited with different denominational leaders. And they offered us a few different positions. And on the flight back, and Steph and I are talking, I just couldn't get a piece that God's vision was for us to move to Southern California simply for the weather. It just didn't seem big enough. And so as badly as I wanted to do that, we did. God has a sense of humor because he didn't take me to the beautiful weather of Southern California. He brought me to the hellish weather of South Florida, okay? Because uh, I'm, I'm not a sun person, okay? But anyways... Yeah, we stopped. We didn't continue to pursue it and try to make it work. At other times, I'm sure we have. But it's important to hold the dream lightly because at the end of the day, your greatest fulfillment, your greatest legacy, your greatest destiny is only going to be accomplished when you're a part of God's dream, which is always going to be bigger than you and me. After God says no, our dream gets bigger. It gets kingdom-minded. Look what happens in Samuel 7. After God tells David, you're not the one, David. You're not going to do this. David doesn't pout and say, well, it's not fair. Because think about it. Whose dream was it to build the temple? David. What's the first temple called, if you know your biblical history? Is it called David's temple? No. All throughout history, secular historians, you know what they call that first temple? Solomon's temple. Talk about humility. You think David pouts and says, okay, God, I guess you're God. I guess I'll do whatever you want. No, no, look at what he says. When he realizes that God's dream is bigger than just a house, just like it is for you. God's dream is bigger than just for you to build a company or just for us to build a local church or just for you to build a family. Those things may be part of the dream, but understand, God's dream is kingdom-minded. God's dreams are eternal. And look at how David responds. He says, how great you are, O sovereign Lord. There was no one like you. We've never heard of another God like you. Right? God told him, he said, you know, you're right in wanting to build a temple for me. But you're not going to build it, David. It's your son who will build my temple. And it's through you that the kingdom of God will even come about. Once you see a stop sign, what are you supposed to do? And I've told you before how in Little Rock we were going to start a church and it kind of blew up. And they said, the denomination the said they weren't going to support it. And I knew in my heart that we didn't need to stay and try to make it happen if we weren't going to have their support. But the hardest thing in the world was to then ask the question, what do we do? And maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you know the dream that you're pursuing is not exactly the dream that God has for you. But you're not sure how to stop. 
you're not sure how to go in another direction. Well, David teaches us that what we have to do is embrace the role God's given us in his dream. We have to embrace the role. And you know what that takes? Humility. Because now all of a sudden you're a part of a bigger dream. But it's not per se your dream. It's God's dream for you. Now, Pastor Joel often kind of has these events where he travels around the country. And he will fill up stadiums. I've been there when Yankee Stadium in New York is filled up with people that are there to hear a message of hope from Pastor Joel. He's been down here several times and other places all around the country. And every time he does one of these events, he'll have, I don't know, eight or ten pastors who will kind of come up and give a word of encouragement. But you're supposed to take like 30 seconds to do this. All right, they'll give you like a topic and they'll say, hey, take 30 seconds to do this. But some pastors forget what their role is. And they actually start to believe that those tens of thousands of people are there for them. And rather than take 30 seconds, they just kind of go on and on and on and on. I've, I've been there when the sound people have actually turned off the pastor's microphone. And so he's blabbing but nobody can actually hear them. Now, it doesn't mean that that pastor is a bad person. It just simply means that it's often difficult to play the roles that we've been given. We sometimes want to be acknowledged in a greater way. And one of the great things that is uh, here about King David is David doesn't get mad and say, well, God, I'm the king. I don't even know which one of my sons is going to be the king in the future. Who knows what the future holds? We live in this chaotic, ancient world where people are dying and kingdoms are changing all the time. Why can't we just go ahead and do it? And yet, look what the scripture says in Chronicles 29. He says, then King David turned to the assembly and he said, my son Solomon, whom God has clearly chosen, so some time has passed, he's going to be the next king. But he's young and he's inexperienced. The work ahead of him is enormous for the temple he's going to build is not just for mere mortals. It's for the God himself. So what has the king done? He says, I've been using every resource at my command. I've gathered as much as I could for building the temple of God. David didn't pout when he didn't get to do what was originally in his heart. He realized that God's dream was much larger, but for God's dream to be larger, his role had to be smaller. John the Baptist said, he has to increase, but I have to decrease. I have to humble myself to play the role that God has for me. How many times, can I tell you as a pastor what I see happen a lot of times? People get dreams. And sometimes they'll come and they'll say, this is what I'm, God wants me to do. And sometimes maybe it's not the right timing or maybe there's not the right funding for it or, or whatever it might be. And often people get called by God to go somewhere else. Because it's hard. Pastors do this all the time. They'll share a vision and it doesn't move forward. And it's like, well, you know, I hate to share this with you, congregation, but God's calling me on to a people who aren't quite as stubborn as you are. Why? Because it's hard to be humble. It's hard to passionately pursue the role that God's given you. Right? How about you and me? Are we passionately pursuing the role that God's given us in order to bring about transformation to our world? We complain about what goes on in politics and what goes on in education and what goes on in our communities and crime and the fact that young people are taking their lives and marriages. I mean, we know what they are and we talk about them, but are we passionately? What, what, was, what was it that David uh, said? He said, using every resource at my command. And then the fourth thing we learned from him is that he pursues that dream with passion. He doesn't just fulfill the role. He's like, okay, God, if you don't want me to be the leader, I won't be the leader in that way. And I, know, I want you to be the leader in the role I've given you. And David says, you know what, God? 
this dream so big, I'm going to passionately embrace that. Look at what it says. And Disney did the same thing, by the way. I put his quote there. When Disney was on his deathbed, it said that he was laying on his deathbed, and he's looking up at the ceiling, and there are those, you know, square tiles. And his brother Roy is there, and he's kind of laying out in those square tire, tiles what he thinks Epcot ought to be, even though Walt knows he's never going to leave that himself. He's, he's going to pass on. He's not going to leave that hospital. Disney said that when you believe in a thing, believe in it all the way, implicitly and unquestionably. And I just want to ask you, do you believe in God passionately? Do you believe in the dream that he has for you, for your family, your business, his church? And are you pursuing the role that you have passionately? Or are you just here? God wants more from all of us. Am I just sitting in my recliner at home when it comes to parenting? Do I just go into work because after all, my job doesn't feel that important? Do I go to church because I think I ought to? In other words, I'm living my whole life without any sense of passion, believing that the role I have was given to me by God to be a part of something that's much bigger than me. I may never sit in the big chair. I may never get the golden ring. But I have been created by God on purpose to fulfill this role passionately. I'm amazed at David's ability to do this. David, look at what David says in Chronicles 22. Now behold, with great pains I have prepared for the house of the Lord. And some of that I'm sure was sacrifice. But some of it, I'm sure, was just pride and ego and having to give that up. And I'm sure people said, well, David, when are you going to start? And he's like, that's not my role. How hard do you think that was to say? But David, you're the king. You, you've led us to victory. We've defeated the Philistines and we defeated the Amalekites. And, and you're, what, what, what? That's not my role but I am passionately going to pursue the role God's given me. He said it was painful. David was so passionate that even though Solomon was the one who was going to actually build it, and it wasn't until after David would be gone that Jesus would actually come and the kingdom of God would be set up. But he was so passionate he couldn't sleep at night. That's what Psalm 132 says. It says, oh God, remember David, remember all his troubles, and remember how he promised God. He made a vow to the strong God of Jacob. I'm not going to go home. I'm not going to go to bed. I'm not going to go to sleep. I'm not even going to rest until I find a home for God. What about you and me? Are we passionately pursuing? Because it's easy to get discouraged and just to start to go through the motions. Am I doing all I can? can tell you after COVID, it's, it's challenging. People aren't as faithful. They aren't as consistent. They don't serve like they once did. And I'm not just talking about potential church. I'm talking about almost literally around the world. There's always a few exceptions. It's easy to just go through the motions. This is what it is. That's what, but when we can humble ourselves to say, this is the role that God's given me. And so I'm passionately going to pursue it. And how do we know if we're passionately pursuing it? Because I don't know about you, I'm good at fooling myself, aren't you? I get to the end of the day and I think, you know what? I, I didn't eat much today. I'm probably in a calorie deficit. I probably lost weight today. Until I start writing it down. I think, well, that Starbucks coffee, venti, with caramel and chocolate. It, you know, and, and then I realize I'm just not very good. So how do we know if we're being passionately? This is what David teaches us. We have to be willing to sacrifice for the dream. Look at what Disney said. Disney said, my biggest problem is money. He says, you know why? Because it takes a lot of money to make these dreams come true. And, and that's not only true of Disney. That's true of everything, isn't it? It's true of ministry. Every service takes a lot of money for the air conditioning, for the lighting, for the technology. Every time we feed somebody. Even when people bring, like, uh, candy for a trunk or treat, it still costs thousands of dollars just to do trunk or treat. 
everything. Dreams cost money. And while God could rain money down upon us, he chooses to, to challenge us to sacrifice because we're passionate about the vision. And so God gave David the role of finding the location or the land. Now, that's, you know, we, as we've been talking about a school and, you know, can we do it all on this property? Can we expand the property? Land is expensive and difficult. And he finds a great place. And as he walks up, of course, you know, David doesn't come by himself. He's got security. I mean, he's got, you know, he's got his people. And as he's walking up, the landowner's like, oh, my gosh. And David says, I'm interested in your land. He's like, you're the king. You can have it. I won't charge you a thing, David. After all, I'm in after what you're pursuing. But look at what David says. But the king replied to Rana. He says, no, I insist on buying it. For I will not present burnt offerings to the Lord my God that have cost me nothing. Isn't that interesting? Because we tend to pursue God the other way, don't we? It's not that I don't want to sacrifice. It's just I need more in order to sacrifice. Right? We tend to pursue a way in which to serve God without sacrifice. In other words, I'll give God the time I have. I mean... I mean, if the only golf time I have is at 10 o'clock, well, I won't be there this weekend. Because you know how hard it is to get on that golf course. Right? There's a million different things that we're unwilling to sacrifice with our money, with our time, with our talents, with our skills. And again, it's not because we're bad people, because we're human people. Does my skin want to serve God this weekend? Stand out there and direct and help people park or run these cameras or change diapers or teach God's words to five-year-olds or to love on teenagers who are going to look at me like I'm weird, right? Do I want to do those things or do I want to go hit a golf ball? I can tell you which one I'd rather do. Do I want to sit on my back porch and enjoy the nice cool breeze before it gets too hot? I can just watch it online, stay in my jammies, Right? Sacrifice is difficult because where does sacrifice begin? Like I have Temple Centurions coming up. How much are you supposed to sacrifice? Right? I mean, you could go without Starbucks coffee. That's sacrifice. Is that what God wants me to do? Is that what he wants you to do? Do you want me to sell my car? Do you want me to go on a less vacation? He doesn't, he, he, it doesn't say, the Bible doesn't say. Doesn't say, hey, it's Temple Centurion time. Everybody needs to go three months without coffee. Whew, that'd be terrible, wouldn't it? Be a bunch of grumpy Christians. Or he doesn't say, you know, it's, it's time to downscale your house. He doesn't say any of that. He just says, hey, you need sacrifice. And the only way you and I can determine what it is God really wants us to do is that we have to spend the time to hang out with him. And have a heart that's willing to actually do whatever he's asked us to do. That's what Paul said. Paul in the New Testament is receiving an offering for the church in Jerusalem that's struggling. They need money. And Paul is charged with standing before the church and saying, Hey, I know nobody here is rich, but they really need our help. And I want you to look at what he says. First of all, he tries to motivate them. He says, Remember, where you position yourself will determine your blessing. In other words, he says... A stingy planter gets a stingy crop. An ungenerous person isn't blessed by God, right? He says, but a lavish planter gets a lavish crop. In other words, if I'm positioned in the right place, then God blesses me. But notice what he says next. He doesn't say, therefore, dig deep. Get your, what do we get out today? Our phone so we can use, I don't, you know, people used to say checkbook. But notice what he says. He says, I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over and make up your own mind what you're going to give. In other words, this is not between you and Paul. This is not between me and you. This is between you and God. He says that will protect you against sob stories and arm twisting. Because at the end of the day, it's not that God needs my money or my time or my great skills. People pastored this church long before I got here, and long after I'm gone, people will. What, what does he say? What's God after? God loves it when we give out of delight. 
He loves it when we give because we realize we're playing a role in the dream that he has for us in this season and this time to bring about transformation. So what does it mean as we get closer to that giving weekend? We all have to determine that because God wants us to maybe wrestle with the fear of sacrifice, but be excited with the possibility of sacrifice. And lastly, and I'll shut up, all right? As we dream big, hold loosely that dream, embrace our role, passionately pursue it, sacrifice, but then remember, and this is the part we forget, that's why I say remember, there's a cost to not pursuing God's dream for you. He, he tells them. Now, for you to understand these scriptures, I need to give you some dates, okay? So you can look on the outline or you can look up on the screen. Solomon's temple, this one we've just been studying, was finished in 966 B.C. And remember, when we're going, you know, B.C. or B.C.E., we're going, we're going backwards. The number's not getting bigger, it's getting smaller. And so it stood for over 400 years till the Babylonians came in. And if you remember, they destroyed it. And then so you got the story of Daniel and the lion's den. All of that happens because they're taken back to Babylon. Till eventually the Persians take control of the world. And Darius allows the Jews to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And you read about it in Ezra and Haggai. And then Nehemiah rebuilds the wall. Well, Zerubbabel goes back in five, around 515 B.C. So about 70 years. That's what God told him in Jeremiah 29 11. He says, I've got a plan for you. And it's a good plan, but it's 70 years in the future. Now, the temple that Zerubbabel built wasn't as big as the first one. It wasn't as impressive because they were much poorer. But God told them that he would bring people that would make it even grander than the first temple. And he did. In 20 B.C., the Romans are now in power, and King Herod rebuilds the temple. It's even grander, larger, more gold than the original one. And from 20 B.C. to 70 A.D., this is the temple that's there during the time of Christ, but the Jews get sideways with the Romans, and it's destroyed. And that's why if you go to Israel today, there is no temple, okay? There's uh, the, the Muslim place of worship in its place, its spot, the, the golden dome, but there is, there is no temple. Now, Haggai was written at 515 B.C. Haggai is the preacher, the prophet, that God uses to motivate the Jews to rebuild the temple for the second temple. Because, think about this, they get... They go from being enslaved in Babylon to coming home. What do you think the first thing they want to do is? Pursue God's dream or their own? What do we do? What do we do when we get the raise? Uh, how do we determine where we're going to live and where we're going to move? God's dream or our dream? I take the job that fits me or did I take the job that allows me to play the role passionately that God has for me? Well, they're like us because we're all just people. And so God tells the preacher, he says, you need to tell him something. Look at what he tells him in Haggai chapter 1. So it's a message of the God of angels' armies. The people procrastinate. In other words, you said you were going to serve once the kids got older. <laughs> they're 13. You're still not serving. Right? You said you were going to start giving once you got situated. You've been living in that house for months and you're still not being generous. You're still not, in other words, God says, you need to tell them they're procrastinating. They say it just isn't the right time to rebuild my temple, the temple of God. And then God says more. He said, how is it that it's the right time for you to live in your new homes, right? You, you came from Babylon. I got you out of there. And the first thing you did is build your own house. Why is it right for you to live in your home, but God's temple be in ruins? And then a little later, God said, take a good look. I'm talking about a hard look at your life. Just think it over. You spend a lot of money, but you ain't much to show for it. You keep filling your plate, but you never really get filled up. 
Lord, you keep building bigger homes, but they don't satisfy. You keep getting better jobs, but it doesn't seem to pay the bills. He says, you keep drinking and drinking and drinking, but you're always thirsty. You put on layer after layer of clothes, but you can't get warm. Now, how about the people who work for you? What are they getting out of it? Not much. A leaky, rusted old bucket. That's why God of the angel army says, you need to take a good look. A hard look at your life, he says, and think it over. In other words, what, what's he saying? He's saying, you tend to think that the circumstances are, are the obstacle to you being obedient. When the circumstances are the result of your disobedience. In other words, I can't give right now, Troy, because of this. Or I can't serve right now because of this. And what God is saying here in his word, he's saying, you need to think this over. Maybe the reason you're struggling the way you are is because you haven't been obedient. Your priorities have been out of line. Maybe God's reminding all of us that we need to reposition ourselves. Only you know that. I, I just know what his word says. Well, these folks repent. They build the temple. It's not as big as they'd like, but it's what God wanted. The problem is they're too much like us because they forget. Less than a hundred years later, they're doing the same thing. They've got their focus on them instead of their priority on passionately pursuing the role that God has for them amongst his people. Look, this is book of Malachi. It's the last book of the Old Testament. We're getting really close to the kingdom of God as Jesus burst on the scene. But they're distracted. Maybe like God's, maybe we're closer to God's return than we know. I don't know, but listen to what God says. You've probably heard the scripture before, but I want you to understand that's the context. It's less than 100 years after what we just read in Haggai, and they repent, and they get everything focused with God. And God says, you know, you, you just got to begin. If you're going to get right with me, you got to begin by being honest. I mean, after all, do honest people rob God? In other words, God says, I'm tired of hearing about all your problems, all your challenges, all your struggles, as if I can't do anything about it. He says, you got to get honest. Do honest people rob me? But you rob me day after day. And you say, well, God, we would never do that. We didn't break into the church. We didn't steal the church's money. We didn't take its chairs. We didn't take its sound system. How have we robbed you? And, and then he tells him, he says, it's your tithe and your offering, your generosity. That's how. And he says, as a result, and this is the part that's important for all of us. Now you're out of position. In other words, you're under a curse. The whole lot of you, because you're robbing me. He says, you can fix it. How do you fix it? Bring your, and I've always been intrigued, because he doesn't say just bring your tithe, he says bring your full tithe. Because if you read chapter one, what they were doing, it wasn't that they weren't giving, they were giving sick animals when God required healthy animals. God says, try that with the government. Uh, it didn't work. He says, you, you expect me? You expect me to believe that the little you do is actually all you can do? When you're, you give more to your employer, you give more to the little league coach that your son pays for than you do me? You, you think I'm impressed? Right? I mean, th that's what he's saying. He says, so bring your full tithe to the temple treasury. Why? So that there'll be provision to do what God wants to do. And then God knows us. So he says, test me. See if I won't open up heaven itself to you and pour out a blessing beyond your wildest dreams. I don't know exactly what all that means. I think it means something different for everybody. But I do know this part because it's really clear. He says, for my part, I will what? I will defend you. I will protect you. In other words, God says, I'm going to get in between you and those things that are trying to rob you of the blessing I want to give you. I don't know about in 2024, that's really important to me because I have no idea what's going to happen in the election. I have no idea what's going to happen between Iran and Israel and what's going on there. I don't know what's going to happen with Ukraine and Russia. And who knows what in the world's going to explode somewhere in the coming months. But what I do know is that God says if I position myself in a place of obedience, he gets between me and whatever might happen. And that's a place I want to be. Now, why 
Why is it so difficult then? Why did I say like 10% if that meant of people in the United States are obedient in this area of their life? It's because of what he says right after this. Look at what he says right after this. See if this doesn't sound like you and me. God says, you know, you, 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 you spoke in hard, rude words to me. And we're like, God, when, when did we ever do that? We wouldn't do that. We worship you. We sing the songs. He said, here's what you said. It doesn't pay to serve God. What do we ever get out of it? When we did what he, what God said, we went around being serious about God. It's different than that. Those who take their life into their own hands and are, they're the lucky ones. My neighbor, I mean, he doesn't even believe there is a God, and yet he's the one driving the nice car. He's the one that just got a promotion. He's the one whose kids just got into Harvard. They break all the rules and they get ahead anyway. They push God to the limit and they get by with it. Isn't that sometimes the reason that we have a hard time being generous? It's because we look around and it just seems unfair that God would allow what we're going through when those who seem to be so far from you seem to be experienced so much better of a life. The reality is you and I were created by God on purpose to do something of significance. And we all have different roles in which we play. And they all matter. The only question I have to answer is am I willing to pursue it with passion? There's always those who have greater roles or so it seems. They sit in bigger chairs. They have more fanfare, more impact. And there are always those who have less. Can I focus on what God's called me to do as David did and passionately pursue it? Can you? Can you dream not just your dream, but one much, much bigger and that lasts much, much longer? Would you bow your head? Father, I thank you for these incredible folks the ones that are here in the house and the ones who are watching online. I don't know all that David went through. I know he made mistakes along the way. God, I pray that you'd help all of us to dream a dream that's so much bigger than us. I pray, God, that we would passionately pursue what you've called us to do that we'd be willing to sacrifice for it and be confident of where that obedience positions us. We trust you. And we don't know what the future holds, but we know you have us here to do something about it. We're part of your dream. In Jesus' name, amen.